Live from Pier 3 in San Francisco, welcome to Bloomberg West, where we cover the global technology and media companies that are reshaping our world. I'm Emily Chang. Our focus is on innovation, technology, and the future of business. Let's get straight to the rundown. Facebook keeps tumbling. Day three and the stock hits $31 a share. This as lead underwriter Morgan Stanley is already facing a subpoena over its actions before the start of trading. Google CEO Larry Page lashes out against Facebook, accusing the social network of holding users hostage. What did he mean by those comments and how do users break down in the battle of Facebook versus Google? And we have liftoff. Officially, SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket blasts off in the pre-dawn hours, topped by a space capsule that could become the first commercial vehicle to dock at the International Space Station. We'll hear from SpaceX founder Elon Musk. But first, to the lead. The Facebook postmortem is getting ugly. An investor has now sued the NASDAQ over the initial trading delays. Shares plunged again today, another 9% closing at $31 a piece, well below the initial offering price. The social network stock has lost 19% of its value in just the last two days. And we are now learning new details about discussions between analysts, underwriters, and investors that may reveal what went wrong. Just days before the IPO, Facebook began telling analysts to lower their sales forecasts, in part due to traffic shifting to mobile. Analysts from Morgan Stanley, the lead underwriter on the deal, cut their projections during the roadshow. At the same time, though, some investors say underwriters misled them about how much demand there really was. Either way, Facebook has lost more than $19 billion in the last two days. For more on this, let's bring in our editor-at-large, Corey Johnson. So, Corey, what's the verdict here? Has this IPO been a failure? Well, I mean, you know, the, the parlance of Wall Street is the broken IPO. Did it break through its own price? Yeah, IPO price, is it a failure? But I think that that whole construct is fairly ridiculous. I mean, is this a broken IPO? Well, if you look at it trading below 38 bucks a share, yeah, it's a broken IPO. But what's the purpose of an IPO? It's raising capital for the company. So let's look at what, how much capital was raised, and how that compares to other companies. Big IPOs, tech IPOs we've seen in the last year. Take a look at this. If you look at what uh, happened with, uh, compare, and I've just picked these, but you know, maybe there's wrong comparisons, but Zynga and Groupon. This is how much money was raised by the company. This is not insider selling. Facebook raised $6.8 billion for its corporate coffers. Zynga, a tremendously successful IPO uh, for raising money, raised a billion dollars for this, this you know, startup company here. Groupon, although it's a very big offering, only raised 700000 $700 million uh, for the company, but the rest went to insiders who were selling, including investors. And to be sure, Facebook investors sold as well. Uh, what about the investment banks? Think about the investment banks who got paid in this thing and how much Facebook let them walk away with of the proceeds that were raised. This is the percentage of the, uh, of the deal that went to banks. Facebook, just 0.4%. Zynga, run by, you know, let's not forget Mark uh, Pincus' father was in the investment banking business, 1.8%. Groupon paid 3% of the offering to the underwriters in terms of the underwriting and management fees. So the combination of those two things, I mean, if you look at what Facebook did, they took the money, they didn't give it to the bankers. They raised more money than anyone in technology in a long, long time, maybe ever. So this is a giant IPO that succeeded its primary cause, which is to give Facebook capital. So who were the losers? Really quick, a list of the losers in this deal. If you look at the losers in this deal, they would, you'd have to start with the investment banks, who made less money than they usually do, if you can talk about the tens of millions of dollars Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs and others took for this deal. The NASDAQ, egg in their face, has spent more time trying to make a fancy TV presentation, having their, their CEO dress up like a Star Trek character instead of actually making the offering work. And the stock flippers, those people who really thought that it was their, their fundamental right to buy something and sell it in a couple of seconds, a couple of minutes, and make a lot of money. So who were the winners? Well, there were the inside sellers, most principally uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg himself, uh, a winner because he sold a deal, a company that he really controlled. And next, uh, Excel, Goldman Sachs, selling a bunch of shares at the $38 offering price, better than the market was willing to bear, at least to this point. And Facebook, uh, Facebook themselves, of course, raising so much money in this IPO deal. Again, I think from the perspective of the purpose of the capital markets to raise money for companies to do great things, Facebook won at that game. Emily? All right. Corey Johnson, our editor-at-large, thanks so much. And we are getting some breaking news now. <clears throat> 
from the Wall Street Journal. They are saying that the NASDAQ would have pulled the plug on Facebook's IPO had it known the full extent of the problems that would have been caused by that technical glitch. Let's bring in our senior West Coast correspondent, John Ehrlichman, who's been looking into more details about what exactly happened between the underwriters, analysts, and Facebook ahead of the IPO and NASDAQ in the aftermath. John? And Emily, a late development today as well is that the state of Massachusetts has issued a subpoena tied to what Morgan Stanley may have been saying to its clients ahead of this IPO. Here's what we can tell you that was happening on the roadshow according to one investor who was participating in that IPO. I'll take you back to May 9th. That is the day that Facebook updated its uh, prospectus to highlight what you said earlier in the show, the mobile issue. Remember, we were talking so much about the concerns about more people using Facebook on their phone and what that made for the advertising outlook. Well, as part of that, the analysts at the firms that were underwriting this deal, Morgan Stanley is the one that gets most of the attention, but J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs are also in that group, according to this investor who we spoke to, were calling their clients, including this particular client, and saying, look, our analysts have trimmed their estimates for Facebook based on this most recent development. We wanted to let you know as a potential investor in this deal that they were doing that. Uh, this is stuff that was taking place over the phone, uh, limited email trails in large part because these analysts have yet to officially put coverage on these companies. They're only in the IPO process and they were re re reacting to what was going on uh, in the uh, updated filing from Facebook. Exactly, John. What, ex what exactly are analysts allowed to say, especially if they are affiliated with the underwriter? And, and obviously that's what is going to be debated right now. Morgan Stanley came out with a comment late today saying this is generally what we do during this process. And many are going to make the argument that having the ability for analysts to make these kinds of revisions on the roadshow is important and being able to relay that message to investors is also important just as important as Mark Zuckerberg or Sheryl Sandberg being present in those IPO roadshows and let's also not forget that this was at the time a private company a private company that was soliciting uh, to potential investors the, the, the opportunity to invest in their company and so it wasn't as if they were going out there and speaking to the world of course the reality is that some investors are going to view this as hey, how come you were talking to those investors and not to us, certainly. Emily? Especially a lot of those investors who ended up on the wrong side of the trade. All right, thanks for that. John, there hasn't been a lot to like about Facebook's first few days as a public company. What is the view from inside the investment banking world? John Merriman of Merriman Holdings and Carter Mack of JMP Group are both here to talk about it. First, got to ask you, what's your reaction to this news from the Wall Street Journal that the NASDAQ would have pulled the deal? if they had known that all of this would ensue. John, let's start with you. Mind blower. I mean, just, just another, another nail in the coffin of a whole hatred of Wall Street. I mean, it's just, I'm shocked. I mean, I, I can't believe that happened. Carter? Yeah, I mean, we heard that, that there were issues and that, you know, in hindsight, maybe they would have been best off waiting and trying to get this open on Monday rather than trying to get it open on Friday when they knew they had an issue. So. Who knows, you know, what actually happened with right. this software error and how much of the, the trading that ensued was because of the error itself. But let's talk about what happened in the days leading up to the IPO. How unusual is it for an analyst affiliated with the bank, the lead underwriter, to change their forecast just days ahead of the IPO? I, I think the timing, I, I've never heard of it. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. I've I, I never heard of that happening before. And, and this whole idea of uh, unequal dissemination of information. You know, the institutions heard some chatter. The numbers are coming down. Obviously, retail's not getting that call. So that's what I'm talking about. This whole thing just kills the whole idea of the, the equality of this system. And it goes right to the heart of that. And I'm sure that's what FINRA and the SEC are going after. It is unclear who actually got this message. Carter, does it seem like something fishy or untoward was going on? Well, I mean, them lowering their revenue and earnings estimates, I think, at the end of the day it was a good thing if they really felt like, you know, based on the updated prospectus disclosure that there was an issue with their original revenue estimates. I think what John's talking about is who actually got told that. If, if everyone involved that was purchasing on the IPO understood that and, and there was, you know, full information ahead of the IPO, then 
you know, I think that's good. I think it provides visibility into what the analysts think. Yet at the same time, investors are saying we were being told by Morgan Stanley as well that demand was so big we should, you know, put in as big an order as possible. And then they got more than they actually expected, which spooked a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the that's the age-old game. I mean, right. you, you know, I mean, it's always like, oh, I want. You know, give me a million shares. I don't really want a million shares. God forbid you call me up and go, hey, good news, Emily, we got a million shares for you. You're like, Ugh, and you're choking on it. You really want 300,000. So everybody plays this game of, well, let me figure out if it's really oversubscribed. I better ask for a million and give me 100. And they plug you for the full amount. Everyone's terrified. Okay, John Carter, hang on. Stick around. We're going to continue this conversation after the break. More with John Merriman and Carter Mack coming up. Also, Google CEO Larry Page fans the Facebook fire, the tough words he had for the social network next. And for all the latest tech news, don't forget to check out our tech channel, Bloomberg.com slash technology. Welcome back. I'm Emily Chang. After one of the most anticipated initial public offerings in history, Facebook shares continued their slide today. The company losing 19% of its market cap in just the last two days, and the finger pointing is in full force. Still with us to talk about it is John Merriman of Merriman Holdings and Carter Mack of JMP Group. Let's play the blame game and see where we go. Uh, how much of this is NASDAQ's fault, Carter? Well, obviously, there was a huge issue, and you know, from what we've heard, a lot of people didn't know what positions they held, and people who tried to change or cancel orders during a certain period of time, the NASDAQ system didn't take those cancellations or changes in orders, and then they didn't know what they owned for a couple hours. So you've got to assume that that created a lot of issues around the price action the first day of trading. You just have to. John, do you see this? damaging NASDAQ's long-term credibility. With what you said earlier on, absolutely. You, you can't underestimate the stuff that Carter's talking about. For someone to be short X or long X and not know what they have in their book, is just it goes against the entire system. But I think the real problem is upsizing the deal substantially, you know, what, four or five days before pricing. I think they just effectively threw a blanket on the stock. I mean, you probably X the NASDAQ problems, which you can't say, but X the NASDAQ problems Without them raising that amount, you probably have a $45 stock. I'm not saying it would have stayed at 45, but I think you would have had that one day pop, 45, 48. But you got NASDAQ problems, you got an extra, what, 25% of supply, and they just snuffed it. So, how much then is Morgan Stanley to blame? Well, you know, if you look at this deal, pricing it at the top of the original range and keeping the share size at the original size. I got to believe that deal would have priced and traded a lot better than what they ended up doing. It's hard to say. You know, they obviously felt like they had the demand. I don't know if there were changes in the last couple of days. You know, there was issues around GM pulling their advertising. That created doubts in people's minds. You know, the increase in size, more selling shareholders. All those things conspired to, you know, we've heard from clients that they got a lot more shares than they're expecting to get. And when that happens, as John said earlier, investors get pretty nervous, institutional investors get pretty nervous. John, how about you? In, in the aftermath, Morgan has also been criticized for ignoring what the other underwriters had to say, being relatively guarded throughout the process, and now potentially giving information out selectively. I mean, when you're the lead manager, you've lead manage a lot more deals than I have. So, but when you're the lead manager, typically these guys are not looking for a lot of advice. They're running the show. It's their show. It's very difficult to have a committee type uh, effect going on. You got to have somebody strong at the top. So I don't, I, I can't say these guys could get together around the table. Now, if there were a real problem inside there that we don't, we're, we're not hearing about yet, then they should have rolled their sleeves up with the, with the five top guys and said, okay, what do we do here, fellas? Do we push this back? Do we crank it down? Okay, I don't, we don't know. It'll all come out in the wash because people are going to get sued. As you said, Carter, there was a string of negative news in the days before Facebook updated its S1. Yep. There was some more negative information. How much of this is because, truly because of Facebook's fundamentals, as it should be, but not necessarily. Well, you've got to believe that created some doubts in people's minds. I mean, I, I believe at $38 a share, there wasn't a lot of upside to this stock. I mean, a $100 billion total company valuation, 100 times earnings, 26 times revenues. I mean, Facebook 
it, it needs to get everything right to support that kind of valuation. So there just wasn't a lot of upward potential besides just what was, you know, the hype that was being fed to the retail market and everyone expecting a big first day pop. I don't think it would have been sustainable if it had hit $45, $50 a share. It probably would have trended down pretty quickly. John, how does this impact other IPOs? Well, I mean, I think that one thing we haven't seen yet is we haven't seen some of the, the smaller companies that actually trade at reasonable valuations go public. I'd be interested in seeing that. I know you would, too. I mean, so there's companies out there that, that can go public trading at 12 and 15 times earnings and one and two times sales that are going fast, but they're smaller companies. The market just cares about retail, cares about or used to care about Facebook and Apple. That's it, right? Yeah. So I'd like to see the companies that really make America great, per se, the smaller companies, okay, be able to go public and access the capital markets. The, the untold story here is that the technology IPO market so far in 2012, ex-Facebook, has done exceedingly well. Mm -hmm. Average first day gains for technology companies this year have been over 27%. And those have held. The, the average technology IPO is up 26% today. But Facebook's getting all the attention. John Merriman and Carter Mack, thanks so much for joining us today. Okay. Thanks so much. For the postmortem. <laughs> Coming up, Google CEO Larry Page takes a swipe at Facebook, saying the social network is holding users hostage. We have the story behind those comments next. Welcome back to Bloomberg West. I'm Emily Chang. In New York, some of Silicon Alley's hottest startups gathered today at the TechCrunch Disrupt Conference. Bloomberg's Christina Alessi is also there, and she joins us live from New York's Pier 94. Now, Christina, how's it going out there? It's going great. It's certainly not as nice as a pier as the one you have back in San Francisco at Bloomberg's headquarters, but it's exciting nonetheless. And we actually got a chance to catch up with uh, the CEO of AOL. Uh, Tim Armstrong, who, as you know, AOL owns TechCrunch, uh, and this is what the conference is all about. So before I got his thoughts specifically about AOL strategy, however, I did talk to him about Facebook's stock slide. We live in a time period where the stock markets across the globe uh, have been challenging, and I think uh, you also live in a time where valuations have gone all over the place for the tech companies and for even for things like real estate. So I think, you know, over time things tend to even out and will average out, so not surprising. You know, in addition to that, AOL, we talked about Facebook, but in addition to that, AOL has come under fire for not articulating its growth strategy going forward. And here's what he had to say about that. We envision AOL being an independent, strong growth company. Uh, and if it's not, it'll only be because of the fact that we did such a good job building out our products and services that it's too attractive for somebody larger than us not to partner with us. But as of right now, we are only focused on building AOL as an independent company. So independent, but that doesn't mean they won't do deals. In fact, he said, you know, there's nothing in the pipeline immediately, but he is looking for more content deals, more companies that actually have strong brands, a strong following globally. All right. Thanks so much. Christina Aleshi joining us live from TechCrunch Disrupt in New York. Now, Google's purchase of Motorola Mobility is now official. The $12.5 billion deal closed today after winning approval from regulators in China. It's Google's biggest acquisition ever. Google executive Dennis Woodside will be the new CEO of Motorola Mobility. He says our aim is simple, to focus Motorola Mobility's remarkable talent on fewer, bigger bets and create wonderful devices that are used by people around the world. Google also gets access to Motorola Mobility's 17,000 patents and an extra 7,500 that are awaiting approval. The patents will be used to help fend off challenges to its Android operating system. Meantime, Google CEO Larry Page has taken a fresh shot at Facebook. In an interview with Charlie Rose, Page said the social network is holding its users hostage by not releasing their data. Our senior West Coast correspondent, John Ehrlichman, has that story. Larry Page piling on, piling on. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it, it, look, the Facebook IPO has given investors a great opportunity to compare these two businesses. And there are big differences in these latest comments from Larry Page 
a great example of that. At a time when the world is focused on Facebook, Google CEO Larry Page took a shot at the Facebook firewall. I think it's been unfortunate that Facebook has been pretty closed with yes. their data. Unfortunate, perhaps, because Google's business, which pulled in nearly $40 billion in revenue last year, is based on being able to search anything and everything on the web. A number of companies, including Facebook, have enabled and actually encouraged their users to essentially wall off a lot of their profiles, um, content, and communications from uh, the broader inter internet. Google faced a similar challenge when MySpace had the hot hand in social media, resulting in a $900 million deal to gain access to the MySpace platform. With Facebook, no such deal exists, prompting Page to suggest that Facebook's strategy is like holding its users hostage. I think that uh, you, know, you don't want to be holding your users hostage. But do Facebook users really feel that way? Bloomberg recently took to Times Square and asked passers-by if they had to give up Google or Facebook, which one would it be? Probably Google, because <laughs> Facebook's how I, like, I talk to my friends. I'd probably give up Google. Google, probably first. I guess Google. I think I'd have to give up Google. I would never give up uh, Facebook. <laughs> Page's comments also come as Google closes on its $12.5 billion purchase of Motorola. A deal analysts say could actually lead to Google having a less open approach. A lot of people believe um, that their acquisition of Motorola Mobility is going to enable them possibly um, to uh, pursue a solution that's more akin to uh, what Apple has done over time. Now, Google and Facebook, obviously, not so tight, but Facebook and Microsoft, on the other hand, have a very close relationship. I mean, it's so important. It wasn't that long after Google and MySpace cut their deal that Microsoft bought a 1.5% stake in Facebook for $240 million. Earlier this month, we talked about some of the new changes to Bing, which are very Facebook friendly, a lot more integration. But, you know, I don't think people will feel that much sympathy for Larry Page's comments because when it comes to search, we know Google still the dominant name, even when you combine the powers of Facebook and Bing. Indeed. Really, really interesting to hear the, those, those comments from Larry Page, though. Thanks so much, John. Now, remember when phones were used to make calls rather than just text or take pictures? Well, coming up, a San Francisco-based startup is launching a new app to revolutionize the old phone call. And which baby face South African grew up to take on not just the automotive industry, but also challenge aerospace? That's next. You are watching Bloomberg West, where we focus on technology and the future of business. I'm Emily Chang with your Bloomberg Top Headlines. Best Buy reported mixed first quarter earnings, profit falling 26%, but the retailer was able to lure customers, some customers, with discounts on smartphones. Meantime, Best Buy selected executive search firm Spencer Stewart to conduct the search for its new CEO. Former CEO Brian Dunn stepped down following a questionable relationship with a female employee. Microsoft CEO Steve Ballmer told the forum in Seoul that he expects 350 million devices running Windows 7 to be shipped this year. Ballmer also predicted 500 million people will be using Windows 8 by the end of next year. Windows 8 is expected to go on sale in October. CBS is claiming victory in the ratings race. The network says it finished number one in prime time for the ninth time in the last 10 years. CBS says it averaged 11.7 million viewers a night and led runner-up Fox by the widest margins in 23 years. Fox, however, beat CBS in the all-important 18 to 49-year-old age group. San Francisco-based startup Sidecar is trying to make your smartphone even smarter. Today, they are launching a new app to let smartphone users share location, photos, and live video during calls. Our editor-at-large, Corey Johnson, has more on this from the newsroom. Corey? Very cool app, Sidecar. The money behind Sidecar, some of the smartest money in tech. Excel Partners have brought us, among other things, a company called Facebook. We've mentioned Facebook before on this show. Excel Partner and Real Networks founder Rob Glazer joins me. Rob, uh, cool app. I thought Sidecar was a drink. 
Uh, Sidecar is a drink, uh, and we hope to toast to its success <laughs> a, a lot in the in the weeks and months ahead. But it was this really cool thing where we, you know, everyone has smartphones, you know, Android phones, iPhones, but no one had really stepped back and say on the phone call what happens between hello and goodbye. How can we reinvent it if the person you're calling also has a smartphone? And so that was what we decided to do with Sidecar, and we came up with something that uh, you know just it's just a couple hours into launch, but overall we're feeling great about how it's going. Well, so let's talk about some of this. So one of those things is the sort of video call. The hey, I'm sta you won't believe who's standing next to me, and then during the phone call you can lift it up and do essentially what Apple advertises, FaceTime, and others have right. tried. Yeah. Well, there are there are some two-way video app, app calling applications right. that's great, but a lot of the applications are things like what we call See What I See, where literally I can be at a concert, I just put it up and I show you the band, or you know, if I'm in real estate and I want to show a prospective buyer the house, I can just put up my camera and not make them put on makeup and look great and photogenic for me, when really what all they want to do is see what I'm seeing. Right. And we also support uh, sharing photos immediately during the phone call, sharing contacts, sharing map locations. I so think the map thing's really good. I'm, I, I'm not saying my wife always get lost, gets lost, I'm just saying the conversation, well, where are you right now? I don't know where I am. Exactly. A map that you can exchange during a call is, is, seems brilliant. The where are you right now, push a button and answer the question. The where should we meet for lunch, pick a place right in the middle of where the two of you are. There's many, many scenarios. Look, all this is stuff that people are doing today with their smartphones, but they're just not doing them inside a phone call. And Sidecar is the first application that integrates all those features right in the call. I'm really intrigued also by the fact that this works over Wi-Fi as well as working over a phone call so that you can, in some ways, in some ways you're, you're going uh, completely subverting the, the telephone network by using Wi-Fi to exchange data and voice at the same time. Well, basically, the idea of, of Wi-Fi is a lot of people, you know, if they live out in a, in a rural area or they may not have good cell service, they have good Wi-Fi. So for a lot of people, you get a better experience. We also, with Sidecar, decided, look, we want to make this as easy as possible for people to get going with. So if you're on Wi-Fi, you can call anywhere in the U.S. and Canada for free, even if the person you're calling doesn't have Sidecar yet. Do so you need a, a wide... We, we broke... Uh, we had some news yesterday on the show about uh, Comcast and Time Warner, some of the other cable companies, partnering strangely with Verizon, that's a whole other thing, yep. uh, uh, to offer Wi Fi hotspots. Do you need a, a more robust wi -fi, you know, yeah. global Wi Fi network to make well, this thing work? Well, because we work over, over, the, over the license spectrum as well as Wi Fi, we work on either one. So we're happy either way. And basically, that's a, the nice thing about modern communications. You can sort of go back and forth, and uh, we are, offer a really good experience on 3G, an even better experience on 4G, and an amazing experience on Wi-Fi, so we work on all of them. Now, uh, we don't have a lot of time, but I, I want to ask you about Facebook. Uh, Excel, uh, a big investor, early investor in Facebook, a seller of Facebook shares. Uh, I, I know you're a partner there, not your investment, but what your thoughts are about Facebook? I'm personally very bullish on Facebook. I remember when Jim Breyer first talked to me about uh, thinking about whether Excel should invest in Facebook. Jim had been on Real Networks board for about a dozen years as a, as a close friend. Real Networks, an uh, uh, internet pioneer, a company you founded? I founded in 1994, so I, it's, I've been around for a while. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so Jim was on our board, and and uh, Jim asked me what I thought about Facebook, and I said, seems like a great opportunity, Jim. And he managed to put together the first uh, venture investment in Facebook, and it's been an amazing seven-year ride. I'm personally very bullish on it, uh, not just as a, uh, as an, as an, uh, you know, somebody Completely who's... vested interest. Well, I, 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 no, but I, I'm glad you disclosed that. But I believe in the e-commerce opportunities for Facebook as much as I believe in the audience opportunities. And obviously with games, they've really cracked the code, but I think there's lots of opportunities in other categories uh, to have that, uh, that, that a personal wallet be an important, more and more important part of people's lives. Do, do you think that that's been part of the Facebook plan that to build audience, you know, not unlike, uh, maybe a little unlike Sidecar, but build an audience, build a successful application of the technology that we can muster, and then at layer on a revenue and, and not rush out e-commerce, for example. Well, I think, I think I mean, if obviously, when you look at what Facebook started, I mean, they, they amassed a huge audience before they started monetizing it, and then they had a huge audience, and they invited application developers in there. So any of these businesses, be it Facebook, hopefully in three or four years from now, we'll be talking about Sidecar in the same light. If you build a really, really big audience, there's a lot of different ways to monetize that. And Google's shown one set of ways, Facebook's shown another set of ways. Uh, there's a lot of ways to do it. Uh, you know, if something like Skype, shown another set of ways. And be it offering premium service to people, be it monetizing the audience through advertising, be it something like search, which right. is a very targeted uh, method of, uh, of direct response advertising. There's those three methods, and at scale, they all work beautifully. Rob, I want to get you back on the show at a different time to talk about music because you've been working on online music longer than anyone, so I want to get you on. Happy to be back I'm not on. saying you're old. I'm just saying thank you. Rob Glazer, uh, Excel partner, founder of Real Networks. Thank you very much. Good seeing you, Corey. Emily? Thanks, Corey.
What do you get when you take a serial entrepreneur, a Bloomberg TV editor at large, and a fast car with some rocket fuel? Find out next on Bloomberg West. Welcome back. I'm Emily Chang. The cloud craze continues, fresh off its multi billion dollar purchase of Success Factors. Software heavyweight SAP has agreed to buy online trading platform Ariba for a whopping $4.3 billion, its biggest push yet into cloud computing. For more on the deal, let's check back in with John Ehrlichman. John? Emily, thanks. And I'm here in the newsroom with Aaron Riccadella of the Bloomberg News team. Um, Ariba. Kind of a blast from the past, actually. This is a. <laughs> Ariba is a company that went public back in '99. Yeah. There was this wave of online exchanges that was particularly hot in the late '90s. Um, SAP just bought them today. SAP has paid up for this asset. And, and we're talking about as a, as a network for buyers and sellers used by businesses, and it's connected to the cloud. Explain that very quickly. So what Ariba does is they're an online network. They allow they put they bring buyers and sellers together for business goods, even things like staples supplies right. for offices. Now, SAP has back office software, so this complements what they do quite well. But we see that SAP is paying up for the asset also. And I'm sure Larry Ellison will trash this deal at some point too. But the reality is that all the big software players are making huge deals tied to the cloud right now. We're seeing Oracle make some acquisitions in cloud computing. They came in and bought uh, right now in Taleo. SAP back in December paid $3.4 billion for success factors. So people are stocking up as they try to get armed for cloud computing. Hey, I, I want to move to Dell because they just had their earnings. You spoke to the chief financial officer. It was a lousy quarter. What is the takeaway? Dell had a tough quarter. April sales came in lower than expected. They cut the forecast for July. The CFO, Brian Gladden, had said to analysts today there may be some impact on, on earnings this year. Uh, what's happening with Dell, you know, we're seeing that tablet computers and smartphones are starting to cut into sales. This has been happening for they a while. And they said it. They, they were very clear about that. Right? They came out and said that today. Yeah. Um, and tomorrow, HP reports, who knows based on what we saw from Dell, what those numbers are going to look like, but just as important, the layoffs. You reported uh, last week that there could be upwards in the neighborhood of 25,000 layoffs. Uh, give us more guidance on, on what we should be expecting to hear. So we had reported last week that SAP has may lay off as many as 25,000 people. 10, maybe 10 to 15,000 from their services unit. Uh, you know, analysts will be really closely watching the balance sheet, which has been hurt. This is a company with only about $8 billion in cash left, $25.5 billion in debt. People want to see some more health there. At, at HP. Okay, we'll watch for those details tomorrow. Aaron, great reporting as always. Aaron Rickdella of Bloomberg News, and Emily, I'll send it back to you. Thanks so much, John. After numerous delays, SpaceX successfully launched their Falcon 9 rocket from Cape Canaveral, Florida, early this morning, carrying a space capsule that could become the very first commercial vehicle to dock with the International Space Station. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk is also the brains behind electric car company Tesla and the co-founder of PayPal, our Corey Johnson went to L.A. to spend quality time with the man behind the mission. In our latest installment of Innovator, I've been really looking forward to this one. Uh, me too. You know, uh, Better I, I've thought a lot about this. <laughs> you know, if the Apollo mission was a victory for the human race, well, SpaceX aims to be a victory for capitalism. This space race, an entirely different character. Wow, this is awesome. Tesla CEO Elon Musk lives life in the fast lane. Right. Do you feel like it's, I mean, I, you know, we want to talk to you just about the SpaceX thing here today, and I wondered if uh, you can break that fastness. Okay, that's shocking. But Musk wants to go faster than a Tesla, faster than the speed of sound, an intense goal. I think that, you know, right now it's a particularly intense period because we're preparing to dock, uh, launch a mission to dock with the space station, which is is damn hard. Musk's privately held SpaceX aims to make a big business out of what had been a government function. Rocket launches putting commercial payloads in orbit. And it all begins with this, the Dragon spacecraft atop his Falcon 9 rocket, a revolutionary aerospace design of new composite materials, cutting edge welding techniques, complicated rocket designs, and an international space station link managed by robots. That's pretty tricky and it's going to interface obviously with a very defined 
uh, thing, which is the space but station. But this is an important test. <laughs> it's notable in that it's the first time that we're trying to go to the space station. Um, but it, it, but I, I should emphasize that there's a good chance that this, that we don't successfully dock with the space station. I, I, I think I think our odds of success are probably around 60 to 70 percent. Beats Vegas. Uh, <laughs> I suppose it does beat Vegas. This is a big global effort involving 1,800 employees. It's not a quixotic mission to put rich guys in orbit like Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic. Rather, this is about capitalism. SpaceX has 38 flights booked, over $4 billion in orders from telcos, broadcasters, and yes, governments all over the world. An explosive bet from this serial entrepreneur. Do you, uh, do you play cards? Do you gamble? <laughs> I have a hard time playing games where the odds are against me, um, unless, unless it's important. Um, so, I mean, if you'd asked me at the beginning of SpaceX or Tesla uh, whether I thought either one would succeed, I would have said most, most likely not. But you wouldn't have did them anyway? Yeah, because they're important. That's why I say if something's important enough, even if the odds are against you, you should still do it. Born in South Africa, Musk studied physics and business at Wharton. He made his first fortune in 2002, selling his startup PayPal to eBay for a cool one and a half billion dollars. Morgan Stanley gave that to me um, after the sale of PayPal. Musk poured much of that fortune into two crazy startups, putting millions into Tesla, an electric sports car launch, and 100 million of his own money into SpaceX. Musk thinks the entrepreneurial lessons of Silicon Valley will lead to rapid innovation that eluded NASA. Doing my first two companies in, in Silicon Valley um, uh, kind of taught me the Silicon Valley way of business, um, of you know the importance of uh, evolving technology rapidly. Musk has a long fascination with space and science. Well, I did build rockets when I was a kid, and, and in South Africa there were no Estes rockets, so I had to, to figure out uh, how to create um, rocket fuel um, and mix up a solid rocket grain and make rockets sort of myself. But I did a bunch of other things, it was like made a radio and made explosives of various kinds and did, did various odd things. Uh, Thrilling mom as you blew up the cat. Uh, I didn't, no, I did not. Did, <laughs> no pets were harmed. Uh, <laughs> I certainly did not imagine that I would be uh, actually designing and building rockets. I wonder if there was a... Real, real big rockets, I mean. Musk seems driven to go where no capitalist has gone before. I think that there are important problems to solve. Uh, we need to... We need to have a sustainable transport, which is what Tesla is about, and, in the, and we need to uh, have an exciting future in space where we're uh, on track to become a space bearing civilization and a multi planet species. And that's what SpaceX is about. That's Why do we need to be a multi planet species? Uh, well, we don't need to be, but I think it's cooler if we are than if we aren't. And probably we'll, you know, we'll last longer as a species. Hundreds of millions in customer deposits means SpaceX is cash flow positive. And Musk hopes to take SpaceX public when the launches become more routine, making him CEO of two public companies. But all that at once, like, I get the sense from you, you can't help but be involved in all this kind of stuff. Um, I, 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 think I, I, I think it's probably true that I have myself to blame for this. <laughs> So, Emily, the, this week, uh, the rockets up in the air now are up in outer space. They intend to test it for a few days, try to launch the space station on Friday, and then it'll be in the air for a couple of weeks until they try to bring it down to the Pacific Ocean. Um, he was driving that car principally. The reason he smiled the most was just to scare the bejesus out of me, <laughs> which worked. I didn't think you could be scared, Corey Johnson. Fast cars. We'll be Don't watching on it. Friday. Thank you. And we will be right back with more of Bloomberg West. This is Bloomberg West. I'm Emily Chang. Have you ever been reading on a mobile device and wished you could just mark up the document with a highlighter to quickly share with your colleagues? Well, Startup Branchfire offers an application called iAnnotate that empowers users to do that and much more to streamline your digital workflow. Earlier, our own Corey Johnson sat down with Branchfire co founder and CEO Ravi Bhatt to find out just how they made his favorite iPad app. IANNOTATE is a great solution for going paperless on a mobile device. So if you have it on the iPad, for the first time, you can leave paper behind. So I, I have to say, I reached out to you guys uh, on a Sunday night. Yeah, that's I right. Thought, this is my favorite app on the iPad. This yeah, that's is great it. to hear. People always ask me what it is. It's this. Because the ability for me to go through a 10K, highlight what I want to highlight. If I see something bad, I can stamp it with a skull and crossbones. I can search for my annotations if I want to type notes. Sure. I just think this is a fantastic app. 
Do you live in fear that Adobe is going to wake up and try to do the same thing? Well, that would be a great problem to have. I mean, what we love to do is work with users. I mean, our product development strategy is a conversation between us and our users. They're constantly pushing us to do more, and we're innovating yeah. because of them. So. Yeah, I've got to say, the most recent update was, was it really tuned in a lot of stuff. It made finding the tools a lot faster. Sure. Um, I have uh, the geek that I am uh, can often be found in a, <laughs> in a bar late at night, sitting with a cheeseburger, going through a, a 10K, trying to understand what's going on with certain Oh, it makes companies. you quite the popular person, yeah. Exactly. We have a lot of people writing that. In, so, yeah. Real social. Uh -huh. what, what was your inspiration for this initially? Well, we really, really wanted to see people work better. Um, you know, we've been kind of disappointed in what's happened with productivity in general. You know, we've been kind of stuck with the word processor and haven't been able to really move further. And with mobile devices, we saw a great opportunity. We'd been working in interactive legal brief technology and all kinds of other things, but when the iPad came out, we were like, wow, that's our device. So with the iPad and iAnnotate, you're able to really interact with your documents in a way that you really couldn't be able to do before. When I was uh, first at a hedge fund, uh, yeah. there was another analyst that sat next to me. Uh -huh. We both kept the gym bag at our feet, and all day long we'd print out big documents, yeah. throw them in the bag, and sure. read them on our commute and the train on the way home. Right. Do you talk to users whose lives have been changed dramatically, or their, you know, their, their commute or whatever is different now because of things like this? Oh, absolutely. We have uh, Fortune 50 companies where boards of directors just use iAnnotate now. And this is compared to getting a FedEx of a board pack that was a huge ton of information, and then having to get another one back at the home office, so whenever they fly in, they have a big binder of information. Here, their annotations stay with them, their notes stay with them, and it saves thousands of pieces of paper. So you guys make money when you sell the app on right. uh, the store. Um, do you have other sources of income for this? No, right now we are totally a cash flow positive business. Uh, we've been fortunate to be able to, you know, charge a little bit of money and work with users to really develop technology that they find useful today. So, How big is the business? Um, in terms of people, in terms of yeah. Cash, man. Can yeah, you yeah. give me a clue? I didn't yeah, yeah, know that I yeah. Want to sure. Well, well, we're pulling in seven figures, and uh, you know, we we uh, we've been doing you know 100% growth uh, for the last few years. So you know, wow. we're we're looking to, to keep up the trend. Um, wh what is the biggest market for this app? Because it, it is interesting. You know, it has applications in finance, has obvious applications in legal the things. People, the things where do people do a lot of reading and a lot of marking up. Where are you seeing the most usage? Well, one of the big, biggest uses is education. Um, we have lots of medical schools, graduate schools, um, you know, high schools, elementary schools using iAnnotate. Like Stanford Medical has gone entirely paperless. All the students sitting in the classroom are using iAnnotate to mark up lecture notes, slides, that uh, kind of thing. Yeah. Give me a sense. You're, you're only on the iPad, not on the Android devices? Uh, we actually are on Android devices now. Uh, we have a partnership with Samsung, and uh, we're exclusive to them for a while. And then later this summer, we're going to be rolling out to the entire Android world. So. so uh, do, do you guys do a lot of group sales? Because it seems that a corporate sale would be useful, but you've got to get those kind of evangelists inside a company that want it to understand what it is. Yeah, that's true. We, we have done uh, some with uh, big accounting firms, um, some consulting firms. Uh, we're going to be partnering with a company called Good Technology to offer a much more robust enterprise solution right. for uh, large companies that want to do that, uh, be able to annotate, be able to have document management in a secure environment. So for some regulated industries, that's hugely important. So what, for you, what is your favorite uh, uh, device to use? with the highlighter, the stamps, the notes, what is it? Oh, for me, it's highlighter and on the iPad. Um, yeah, I just love to be able to quickly highlight documents and to be able to have all of my notes right there in one place. So, you know, I meet someone a couple weeks later and I want to refresh my memory as to what they were working on. Two seconds with I annotate and I'm there. Corey there with Branchfire co-founder and CEO Ravi Bhatt. Up next, stick around for our B-West Bite, one number that reveals a whole lot. Time now for the B West Bite, where we focus on one number that tells a whole lot. What do we have today? Uh, 30 billion, as in 30 billion dollars, the market cap that has been wiped out since the first trade that was printed on Facebook on IPO day at 42 bucks, closing today around Ouch. 31. That is like LinkedIn, Zynga, and Groupon combined. Uh, I hope that guy didn't keep all the shares. The report is 42 bucks. I mean, it's it's really amazing. And as we reported earlier in the show, now the state of Massachusetts trying to figure out what exactly Morgan Stanley was telling some of the potential clients before the IPO was right. Back. And the Journal now reporting the Nasdaq would have pulled the IPO had they known what would happen. You know, speaking with John oh, Merriman look. and Carter Mack earlier, they they both said this is just mind blowing. It shows you that the focus is so off that the focus is on the presentation of the IPO on the pop of the trade on the the focus is for IPOs has got to be at the end of the day about raising money for companies so they can do great things. Uh, the the postmortem on this will continue for sure just as 
you know. The camera as, shots from Facebook headquarters look great, Facebook continues though. to perform like this in the aftermath. The NASDAQ should Everybody direct TV. Everybody wants to know why. They have those great shots, the boom mics, right. the Star Trek outfit. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us on this edition of Bloomberg West. We'll be back here tomorrow.